quick content note here before we begin this episode of What Am I Rolling? This episode's one-shot, Shiver, is a tabletop role-playing game that lets players bring their favourite scary movies, spooky TV shows and horror stories to life. Specific content warnings for this scenario, Mr. Husk, include violence towards animals, off-screen death, slasher and supernatural killers. So, if you're not in the right headspace just now, please feel free to stop listening and come back if or when you're ready. Thanks again, and stay safe, my friends. Hello, and welcome to What Am I Rolling? A twice monthly RPG one shot podcast, hosted by me, Fiona. This week, I am joined by my friends Chloe, Katie, Ellie, and Am, the cast of Deck of Many Aces for Shiver, the award winning tabletop role playing game bringing tales of the mysterious, the peculiar, and the strange to life. Ever wanted to play through the plot of your favourite film on the tabletop? Or wanted to make sequels, prequels and original stories in the worlds of pop culture that you love? Well, Shiver lets you play that. Published by Parable Games, Shiver has easy to learn rules which makes it fast to play and keeps players immersed in chaotic and dark magic filled stories. Notably, Shiver uses symbolic dice to keep players engaged in the story, as well as providing a visual role-playing aid that does away with pesky maths. Character creation is quick and easy, with a simple skill point and ability system that links to the game's dice. Shiver is perfect for a one-shot or a short story between main campaigns. It can also be used to form longer narratives, tying one-shot stories together using the rules for sequels. You can find out more information about Shiver and Parable Games' other projects on their website. I'll add links to that and to the deck of many aces on the What Am I Rolling website and in this episode show notes. Be sure to check out Deck of Many Aces, an actual play D&D podcast made by actual asexuals and aromantics. Follow our four heroes as they adventure through a fantasy world on the cusp of a technological revolution augmented by magic. Each character's fate is tied to one of the 22 cards in the Deck of Many Things, a D&D magical object based on a tarot deck. You can listen to Deck of Many Aces wherever you listen to podcasts. So, here's how Shiver works. Shiver is built around six core skills. Grit, wit, smart, heart, luck and strange. Each one defines one of Shiver's archetypes and forms the core attributes the players base their characters upon. These skills also correspond to actions the players may want to take within the story and how well their character will perform in them. In addition... Shiver uses the Archetype Die System, a symbolic die system specifically designed for this game. The system composes of two different die types, the Skill Die, which is a D6, and the Talent Die, which is a D8. Instead of numbers, both dice have symbols on them, with each symbol corresponding to one of the core skills, so symbols for Grit, Wit, Smart, Heart, Look and Strange that the players can use. Note that the Talent Dice only uses two different symbols, the strange symbol and the talent symbol, which can count for any core skill symbol other than strange. When characters want to take an action, the director will ask them to make a skill check to determine the outcome. The director will set a challenge rating, ranging between 1 and 5, indicating how many successes a player needs in order to succeed on their check. Each skill check will have one of the core skills associated with it in turn, which will determine what dice the player must roll for their character. For example, in order to barricade a door against advancing zombies, a player might need to roll a grit check versus a challenge rating of two, so we'll need two successes to barricade the door. When performing a skill check, a player checks to see how many skill and talent points their character has in the chosen core skill, and then add the corresponding number of skill and talent dice to their dice pool. Players may also have to add or minus extra dice to their pool depending on any special character abilities, any advantage or disadvantage imposed by the director, any luck die the player might have banked previously, and finally any fear status effects being imposed. This may be skill dice or talent dice depending on what kind of mechanic is being used. After all these steps, 
the player rolls their dice pool and checks the result. In order to succeed on a skill check, the player must roll a number of core skill symbols of the specific type greater than or equal to the challenge rating of the skill check. So, in our previous example, if the player rolled two or more grit symbols, they have succeeded in their grit check of barricading the door. When a player rolls their dice pool, there is always a chance of failure. In Shiver, failure can have darker consequences. The Doom Clock resembles an analogue clock that ticks towards the player's inevitable doom at midnight. The mechanics of the Doom Clock ultimately rely on the actions of the players. The most common way of ticking up the Doom Clock is when a player fails a skill check and rolls a strange symbol in their pool. The Doom Clock ticks up by one minute for each strange symbol rolled. The Doom Clock also ticks up by one minute when a player fails a fear check, but can also be progressed through the weird archetype using their skills, or certain flaws from backgrounds coming into play. Finally, when rolling skill checks, if a luck symbol is rolled, it doesn't contribute to the success of that particular roll, but it does give the players a luck point. A luck point can be banked and then spent by the player on their next skill check, adding an additional skill die to their pool on that roll. Only one luck point can be banked at any one time, though the fool archetype, through specific skills, can bank a few more luck points. If a player rolls two luck symbols on a skill check, both those symbols can be used instantly to tick the doom clock back by one minute, convert them into a success for that skill roll, or use them for another purpose. I got a bit stuck on the luck rules, if I'm honest, during this one shot, certainly during the first half, and I definitely forgot that fear checks are a thing. There are other really cool rules regarding combat and fear checks, which we simply do not have the time to go into here. However, I can highly recommend checking out the Shiver Quick Start Guide, which has everything you need to get you going, as well as the full range of Shiver modules on their website, www.parablegames.co.uk. One last thing before we begin. Naturally, there are times in this one shot where the players and myself, mostly myself, get the rules wrong or forget something plot-wise. Whilst we always endeavour to stick to the rules wherever possible, at the end of the day, we all make mistakes, and what matters most is that everyone enjoys themselves. So, I'm going to be very transparent right at the beginning of this one-shot. We recorded this Shiver one-shot nearly two years ago. It was just after I interviewed Charlie Mendes about the then-upcoming campaign for the Shiver starter sets. The reason this particular one-shot hasn't come out a lot sooner is we had so many issues with tech during recording. Folks' internet went down, microphones weren't working, Zencaster, which I was using at the time, was just having a really bad day, it was super late at night, folks weren't very well, people were tired, the Dice Roller app was a bit clunky in places, as you'll probably hear as we talk about it. Everything that went wrong did go wrong. But... I finally had some time recently to sit down and attempt to give this session some TLC. I really fought for it because I enjoyed running this game for my wonderful friends over at Decamini Aces. Uh, so yeah, just a heads up, this audio might be a bit off in places, but I think it's really worth a listen. Uh, it's a great session uh, about how we learnt to play Shiver, both from a director's point of view and from a player's point of view. I've even managed to include our character creation audio so people can follow along at home how our players made their character choices. So, let's start with that, shall we? Let's play Shiver. Right, okay, folks. So, the task for today's one shot is that you folks are going to come up with a... What did I roll? I rolled a group of indie filmmakers trying to make the next low-budget horror hit are on location when their van breaks down. So I guess we'll, um, does anyone want to go first and say what kind of uh, character they're thinking of building? And if so, what archetype you're going for? Uh, if there's a background and a, a fear, and we can go through that slowly but surely. So in the true spirit of indie horror and indie filmmaking, I have decided a few things about my character, not loads, but in conversation earlier, we've come to the conclusion. My character's name is Rupert Kingsley. <laughs> I haven't discussed how old he is with Katie, who's going to be playing my sibling. But I think they're both 20s, aren't they? I imagine he's probably maybe, maybe 24, 25. Mm -hmm. And he's a little bit uh, of a deadbeat. He's kind of a bit hopeless. 
he wants to be like an indie filmmaker and he, you know, he thinks that he's going to be following all of the greats, uh, <laughs> you know, regularly compares himself to the likes of Kubrick and, you know, <laughs> like all that, all that, that energy just manifest. Mm-hmm. He does have a job, I think probably at, you know, you know, somewhere like, I don't know, like the, the corner shop or something like that. Um, the equivalent and, in 1970s, yeah. Yes. I think they I, had corner shops in the 70s, Eddie. This is, this is a big old <laughs> ramble. I don't even know if you asked for this much information. Oh, I'm interested. Yeah, yeah. so he's he's the director. So he's assembled this posse together um, with promise of probably massively underpayment um, to create this to create this film that is his his vision his, his vision, baby yeah. the um, visionary yeah I see yeah that. so I'm thinking of going with the fool archetype mm-hmm. um, because I'm nothing if not self aware I haven't had a look at backgrounds and such properly yet so that's still yet to be decided Perfect. as is no, that's fine so yeah so the fool when all else fails you you just need some good luck fortunately this archetype has it in spades to make it up for its lack of specific skills which I think that that describes exactly what Rupert is which I yeah. Yeah, well. yeah. I thought I thought about going for the kind of the intellect based one, and then I was like, they sound way too helpful <laughs> in, this, <laughs> in this scenario, and I don't think he would be. Perfect. So if you go to the the full archetype page in the uh, thing, you will see there are some numbers for the core skills, and if you transfer them that to the dice roller, mm-hmm. um, I think luck will be your highest uh, core skill because you'll have some talent dice in there as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, it will also tell you to add or subtract something for your strength and for your deficiency as well, just uh, sort of select a deficiency. Okay, cool. I will start doing that well, we'll come back to you in a second ellie but what once you've done that i want you to everyone's going to be at uh, level five for this one shot so what that means is that you have something in each archetype they have ability trees very much like any video game recently you have sort of five ability points and you can put that into the skills you can either build there's two ways you could do it you could always build high and just select one of the paths and go all the way up or you could sort of build wide the only rule is that you have to have the ability below in order to get the, that ability you want. So, for example, you'll always start at level one, uh, looking at the the grit archetype. That's always going to be tough. But then, you know, as long as you have that one below, you should be fine. So you have five points to do into that. Um, whilst you're doing that, though, who is next? Who else? Should we go to the to the uh, sibling? I think that, yeah, I think that'll be uh, most appropriate. Go for it. I am going to be playing Vicky Kingsley, older sister of Rupert. She is somewhat exasperated by everything about him. Uh, spent her, her days uh, as a delivery driver, hauls stuff about. She has a van. It's her van. And she also acts as a bouncer sometimes for clubs at night, gets some extra cash. Uh, and she's an amateur kickboxer. And she's pretty good at it. So, yeah, she's going to be one of the warrior archetypes. From hand-fisted enforcers to all-star athletes, this archetype is all about feats of strength, able to dole out a heavy hit or take one. So, perfect. So, the same thing again. Put those numbers that you get from that archetype first page, put it into your core skills, uh, add or subtract the, the core skill for what it says, and select a deficiency, and then you can build up what uh, abilities you want from the skill trees. Uh, who's next? I will be playing Laurie Curtis, named for the incomparable Jamie Lee Curtis in Halloween. And I will be playing the archetype of the scholar. Laurie is having a bit of a hard time of it. Um, She loves film and would like to do film for her job, uh, but she's a huge scaredy cat. And this is kind of the only job she could find at the moment. Um, She's very unhappy about being here is going to be scared even from filming it she's going to be teching and yeah she's just not not enjoying herself (laughs) would you say laurie is not not just not a fan of horror films in general no she is absolutely not but obviously because she loves movies she's pretty familiar with archetypes and stuff so like you know Mm. she's gonna be like oh of course this makes perfect sense (laughs) i love it okay cool so yes the scholar knowledge is power and that is this archetype's key skill using their brains over brawn to think their way to survival so same thing again go to that archetype page uh put in the core skills uh and talent die to your relevant skills add and subtract choose a deficiency and then again five points into the ability on the ability tree on the archetype tree and last but not by no means least, who is our final final member of this ragtag team of a film crew? Yes, well, I'm going to be playing uh, Lucy Barrow, 
who uh, is an out of work actor that has somehow ended up playing a role in this film. <laughs> Particularly, she's playing the role of the final girl because there always is one. In terms of archetype, um, mm -hmm. obviously, like socialite would be the obvious choice. However, I also kind of like the idea of her being the weird and actually being t telepathic or something. Oh, <laughs> oh that's good. I so love she's that. all bravado, but actually like harboring this like secret or whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She's probably a little bit like not particularly enamored with the film itself. Mm -hmm. She's here because she needs the work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Perhaps this is something that her that has happened. Recently, perhaps it's something that has always been a thing. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're, you're more than welcome to go for weird. Absolutely. So the weird archetype says, uh, fighting fire with fire may seem ill-advised, but this archetype draws on the unnatural forces in the world to do so, often at a grave cost. And what's interesting about the strange archetype is that when you use your powers, that also contributes sometimes to the ticking forward of the doom clock. Oh, no. So <laughs> So this is what I quite like about this game is that so this idea of the doom clock, this is what sort of helps move things along. You know, like in, in any sort of horror film, there's like little events that happen that push the story along and then till finally the, the enemy appears or the, the antagonist has been revealed, that sort of thing. Uh, and here, this is how we track it. It's not down to me per se, it's down to you, the players, about where, where certain events will happen or not. So often what happens, it means that there's maybe in each team, there's going to be people who are trying to make sure we can claw it back because there are ways to turn back the doom clock. And there are others who are like, nah, we're just going to blast it through and see what happens and stuff, which is always what happens with the weird, which I'm very excited to, to hear about. So, yep, same thing again. Uh, go to the weird archetype page, get the dice stuff out, um, the, the numbers out and, and yep, find yes. ability points and put them as you see fit. Yeah, and just quickly looking at the weird path as well. Yeah, you've got four different kinds of paths. You've got the Eldritch path, the Spiritualist path, the Psionic path, and the Body Horror one. Uh, so yeah, feel free to have a look through those. Um, which one? Of I assume the Psionic one is the one you were thinking of uh, from what you were just talking about. Yeah, because I think it's more likely that sort of thing that she would be able to hide easily, whereas the others are a bit more out there. Sounds good. Sounds good. All right. If we circle back to Rupert, if that's all right, have you managed to do your first bit of the archetypes there, Rupert? I've added all of my stats. I'm just mm -hmm. having a look at the paths at the moment. Yep. The, yeah, I've got the accumulator path, the last chancer path, and the blessed path, or blessed, mm -hmm. if you're feeling pedantic. <laughs> I'm not sure which one to go for, to be honest. I'm trying to think which one is the kind of the most appropriate for the character. Holding on to the, your good fortune to release it at just the right moment. That's for the accumulator. Mm -hmm. The last chance is the odds seem heavily stacked against you, but you manage to turn the tables on others, draining their luck from them to create a minefield of misfortune, which <laughs> sounds like fully <laughs> evil. And I'm, I'm basically, I think the energy that I'm going into with this is that this guy is an asshole, but he just probably needs a lot of therapy and also to listen to women more, not being like <laughs> actually evil. Mm -hmm. And then the blessed path, someone or something out there is looking out for you. By all means, you should be useless, but even a hunch can turn out to be a revelation on this path, which does sound like white male privilege um, <laughs> now that I read it out loud. <laughs> so that might be the one that I end up going down. I always envision um, sort of characters like what you're describing. There's that, There's always those people in Doctor Who who, even though they've been a complete arsehole throughout the whole thing, they don't die they don't disappear they always survive till right at the end and they don't change whereas somebody else has uh died and you're like oh why couldn't you take in those ones so mm. i think it makes sense like the idea that you're just incredibly lucky uh and you take other people's luck from them yeah that's true yeah oh i don't know have, have, have more of a think about it we'll go on to uh we'll go on to vicky next vicky how are you doing on your mm. stuff well i'm uh doing all right i think there's a thing with the warrior uh archetype where it for your once you get to the fifth tier which we're all at um you get uh some extra like skill points yes so if you take if you take one of your paths all the way up like one of them if you're building tall ah, yes okay but some people might go i only want for example they might only go to say on your berserker uh, path they might only go to furious fist but then they might like, want to go oh but i also want mm. stun and so well, they might build I'm, wide. 
I'm still looking through it, but I think I may be going all the way up on the Berserker path. Sounds good. Uh, it's got abilities like Furious Fists and Fury and <laughs> Charge. Um, oh, me- uh, there's, a, there's a Meat Shield ability on the Protector path, though. I mm-hmm. don't know. Fiona, mm-hmm. can you explain the going the uh, sort of going in depth versus going broad again? Like sure. I know you said that you can kind of like the, as long as you've got the thing below it, mm-hmm. you're able to get that ability. But how mm-hmm. how many abilities are we able to have total, and how does it kind of stack? Yep, no worries. So you have so you're all level five. Each level you have, you have one ability point in it. So you, it's imagine if you've ever played like Borderlands or anything like that, where you have those skill points to spend in your trees. You always start at level uh, tier one. Uh, so, for example, looking at the warrior tree or looking at your what? Well, sorry, what was your archetype? The fool. We start the fool. banking on it. Yeah. So that's your first ability. So you've spent one point there, and then if you wanted to build high. That means like this literally just putting all your points and putting it into one path. So for example, you want to be like, oh, I want to go all the way up on the last chance. So you'd be like one point uh, Murphy's Law, sec- uh, another point into cashing it, lucky drain, and then your final point would be plus two core points. But if you're like, oh, I actually, there's some other skills that I really like. You could put like, say, what one into Murphy's Law, one into cashing it, and then you could go ah, oh, clocking it back. I quite like that school, and that would be your next point into there. So okay, you're building, cool. Yeah. So it's it's just basically you couldn't go. Oh, I want to put a point into uh, say lovable fool, which is tier three, without putting a point into clocking it back first. Gotcha. Soon, really. Okay. Cool. All right. I'll have a little look at those, then have more of a think. Yeah. Don't worry. Again, look, we're just going to take it nice and easy, and just just check it out from there. That uh, makes my life so much easier because I was torn between two, and now you have made it easier for me. Hooray. That's that's what I like to hear. Uh, Laurie, how are you doing, Laurie, with your scholar? Good. I think I'm splitting her between academic and engineer. Mm-hmm. Mm. Um, so I've taken level two and level three for academic, and mm-hmm. then I'll probably take level two engineer. I'm just, like, speed reading. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Exactly. Level two engineer, level three engineer... And then level... Well, and that will be it then, because you'll have yeah. one in Medic. So that Of course, sense. yeah. And then Lucy with uh, Final Girl. What, what was your archetype you said? Sorry, I didn't manage to write it down. Uh, weird. weird. I didn't write it down because it's weird. <laughs> what, are you of... thinking? what are you thinking, weird person? Well, I looked at them and the, the sort of first level, was it tier one abilities? I was like, I don't really fancy any of these apart from the telekinesis so i just went full on psionic yep that sounds good so yeah lucy's now telekinetic telepathic has some kind of artifact which i'm not sure what yet that can do weird stuff and i haven't mm-hmm. what's the other one future sight mm-hmm. you can glimpse briefly into the future Ha-ha! <laughs> essentially <laughs> a divination type thing yep Yep, so you go all the way, if you're just doing the psionic, yeah, all and the way up I, to, yeah. Yeah, to I put the two five. extra, because it says plus two core skill points, right? So I put two extra into heart mm-hmm. because she's yep. an actor, and I think that makes sense. <laughs> mm. Love it. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so if you do build high in this particular one shot, uh, so that means you go all the way in one path and you get to tier five, one of them, I think all of them have a plus two core to these skills so that just adds to your mm-hmm. dice pool later on so that's something to figure, figure out doesn't mean that's a, a necessarily gonna prohibit you if you don't do that because you might want to be like i want more abilities and that's totally fine as well uh so is there anyone that feels like they've finished this part of the of their character because we can move on to the next part if other people are finishing up the only thing that i think i still have to decide is this peculiar artifact and what it is um because it says, on your travels, you find a mysterious object, or perhaps an object in your possession becomes imbued with special properties. Um, and I'm not sure what that might be. Well, you could always... I'll tell you what. Why don't you... If at any point in the one shot, you go, wait, I have exactly the thing for this, and we can do a <laughs> flashback moment to what that, that is a great idea. is. And it'll be like... You know, it's like this. You know, it's that flashback moment. that's like this was the perfect thing I needed for this heist. It's the thing I needed for this uh, this horror story. So I can let uh, that you know, would that, be that's helpful. helpful to yes, you, rather I... than like 
and rather than like oh here's like rather than us spending 10 minutes coming up with a backstory and then you forgetting to use true, it because that's true. always what happens with me. we're gonna have so many abilities as well that uh, are not a lot of time to use them so exactly yeah and i will say this to you folks as well um we, we can always stop and you can read through your abilities to play it. and you're like i'm just gonna use this that's always fine as well okay i think i know what i'm doing somewhat counterintuitively to what i said five minutes ago i think i'm mostly going up the last chance path up to tier four so that gives me um banking on it murphy's law cashing in and luck drain which are a variety of cool abilities but i've also instead of going all the way to tier five and getting two an extra two core points Mm -hmm. i'm also going to grab the idiot savant tier two ability because i feel like that's very on brand um is just being able to get random knowledge out of nowhere yeah you're just pulling it out your ass essentially absolutely Um, (laughs) sounds good i am done with subclassy stuff nice excellent all right i think i am going all the way on berserker so that means that uh of my eventual stats i'm getting an extra skill dice in wit Mm -hmm. and in uh let's say smarts and my deficiencies in strange she does not like the bullshit (laughs) (laughs) but nope this is not a this is not a thing so next up once you've decided your archetype the next up is background this is a little bit further on past the archetype stuff so each background uh, can be used for any of the archetypes they are grouped together though under certain themes um and what you can do, and you've already got, a, all of you have got a good idea about what your characters are. Um, so I guess just have a look through and see which one of them uh, appeals to you most and then input what it says in that into the character sheet or write it down. I'm pretty sure she is going to be of the rebel background. Oh, mm-hmm. nice. Under Maverick. Yep. You live by your own rules, smoking under the bleachers, blasting music from your locked bedroom. You listen to no one. You're not my dad. <laughs> um... <laughs> And the ability is keeping a distance, which means after a successful strike, you may immediately make an escape without using an interact action or giving the enemy an attack well, action. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah, very cool. And your flaw mm. is you're uncooperative. You don't play well with others. And you may not assist allies or be assisted by allies Ooh. with skill checks. Oh, brutal. And if you're working together with an ally in any other way, you do so at a minor disadvantage. Yeah, Ooh, that's, that's a good one. So yes, yeah, so each of these backgrounds will have an extra ability that you can add to your sheet, but also a floor as well. Very cool. I like that one. I've got mine. Go for it. The nerd. My glasses. What you lack oh. in physical stature, you make up for oh. in brains and pure cowardice. Ability. Run away. You're a pacifist, <laughs> or that's what you yell as you run away from your attackers in terror. You do not give attack actions when escaping from a... I don't get uh, give attack actions when escaping from a brawl translating to a language I understand. Presumably that means... I, I will get to it if it comes up, don't yeah. worry. I would guess... I'm guessing that means like I don't provoke an attack of opportunity, basically. Yeah. Um, additionally, if you use your move action in combat to move directly away from the enemy you are in a brawl with, your speed becomes fast until the end of your combat oh, turn. that's useful. Oh, very good. Floor weak. You are not much of a physical specimen. If you're wearing armor, your speed becomes slow. I mean, there is literally a background called the actor. So I think I'm going to take that one. There's also a background for the final girl, though. Do you want to be meta and have a final girl be the... Yeah, but she's not She's not actually the final girl, right? She's playing <laughs> she's not the, the final, final girl, girl so I like yet. The, I like the idea that she is the opposite of the final girl in our story, even though she's playing it in the film. <laughs> all right we'll read out the actor background for us then the actor says you've trod on the boards and inhabited roles deeply in your time acting is just another form of lying in the end <laughs> but at least it's entertaining and your ability is going method you truly inhabit any role you take on add plus one talent die to your dice pool when attempting to disguise yourself as someone else and the floor is drama <laughs> queen of course uh, sometimes when performing and in the heat of the moment you can overdo it when making heart checks to lie charm or to persuade others if your role contains two or more successes in excess of the challenge rating, your overacting Ooh. causes you to Ooh. fail. That's pretty cool. So yeah, that will be that'll fun. be fun. Nice. Um, I'm just scrolling back up to the one that I think I'm going to go for, which is the drifter. Um, never stopping in one place too long, you meander through life, picking up work where you can, moving on when your welcome has been outstayed. Although I doubt he'd pick up the message on that on that front. People, funnily enough, aren't all that welcoming, but not being tied down has its benefits. 
ability is street smarts. So I know you know your way around these streets through reams of experience and innate directional sense. You add plus one talent die to your dice pool when navigating. And the floor is lone wolf. You fight your own way, and that usually means you fight alone, just how you like it. You cannot contribute to overwhelming an enemy. So the final, final bit is, she says, scrolling through character sheets, like there's no tomorrow, uh, stage three is choosing a fear. This can be anything from thunderstorms to spooky clowns. Being afraid is part of the fun. So discuss your character's fear with with me, the director, but with all of us. Um, And this bit is just essentially like, it's a role play thing, um, which might come up. It might not. Um, But it's just something that, again, plays into that character, maybe into the floor a little bit as well. There might be points in the one shot where I'm like, roll a fear check and what that means is that i would need you to roll your strange pool and against a particular uh critical rating and if you fail you'll go down a different state of of fear so there are three st- states there are stable which everyone should be at afraid is when you succumb to the fear as it invades your mind and that means you will temporarily lose one core skill die from every core skill um until you are no longer afraid if you go down to the the next level, which is the final level, is terrified. That means you temporarily lose two core skill points from every core skill. So it just gets harder to do things. That is the main thing there. But have a think about what you what you are afraid of. Whether it, it could be something that's um, you know part of the environment, you know something that's you actually realised, or it could be something abstract. It's just to make a sort of a more personal way of making your characters and really sort of play into your choices if it comes up. Um, so I'll open up to the floor. So Laurie's whole deal is that she really likes making films and consuming films because there are rules, there's structure. Um, Things have to go a certain way for things to make sense. Um, I heard Chloe laughing. Yeah. (laughs) She, the, the thing that she fears the most is feeling powerless, basically not having control, not feeling like she, Mm -hmm. she, like she's at the mercy of the situation. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, that's going to be quite a lot of the the uh, game, I assume. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Fair enough. Completely unrelated to anything I've established before, because fears aren't always related to any kind of backstory. She's kind of scared of water and drowning and big pools of water and deep okay. water and all that kind of thing. Whether or not we encounter any water, I've got no idea. That is quite interesting, because I was thinking... Uh, perhaps uh, Lucy's powers get slightly stronger when it rains, and so she has a slight irrational fear of rain. Ooh. Ooh. Very water-based group fear. So being in the rain is kind of scary for her because uh, because she's like, I don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, so it's sort of like you, the, having any sign of rain could trigger off one of these episodes that you don't really have control over. Um, yeah. So yeah, I can see that. Mm. Um, so we all hate water yep. <laughs> yeah and I think I'm going down the same uh, path as Am with a mild bit of self insertion um, <laughs> I think that Rupert's biggest fear is that he is going to be wholly unremarkable and achieve nothing with his life <sighs> Damn. that he's not like some kind of amazing wonderkind that he's actually he's not got what it takes to be one of the greats and that he's never going to actually live up to his expectations of himself. Wow. Super deep. I love it. (laughs) Welcome to the Domacast, Fiona. You're learning lots about them. I know. Well, welcome everyone to Shiver, the horror roleplay RPG. If people can go round, uh, we'll go in the order that I have in my uh, list. So it'll be Chloe, Katie, Ellie, and then Am coming up from the rear. And if you could introduce yourself, your player pronouns, your character, their pronouns, and their archetype. And if you feel like it, their appearance, what they look like, and the general sort of thing. I know we did a little bit of that in the character creation, but just for this recording. So let's go with Chloe, if you're okay to go first. Yeah, hello. Uh, I'm Chloe. Uh, I use she, her pronouns. And I'm going to be playing Lucy Barrow, who is the weird archetype, and is here on set as an actor playing the final girl. Except she is not the final girl. (laughs) Uh, She uses she, her pronouns. Lucy has like 
dyed blonde hair, kind of shoulder length hair. Slightly too much fake tan, but not so much that it looks ridiculous. But it's enough for you to be like, eh. Um, and she's always chewing gum. Lucy, my question to you. So you said you're sort of like, you're, you're cool, a bit of fake tan, etc. I want to know what Lucy has on them. As a, like, I know you've got that artifact, which we'll hopefully come back to in the one mm. shot. But like, is there something that you always keep on you? Maybe like a certain type of chewing gum, like a brand of chewing gum, or like a, maybe a, a photo in your wallet or something like that? She always has her lucky lipstick. <gasps> it is Ooh. bright red. She doesn't nice. wear it all the time. Mm -hmm. but it's there in case she ever needs to whip it out you know i love that you gotta look the part exactly you You can never be caught out without your red lipstick brilliant thank you so much and welcome lucy next up uh katie can you introduce yourself hi i'm katie uh i can i use she her or they them pronouns and i am playing vicky vicky kingsley she is of the warrior archetype um Mm -hmm. and she is here to to kick ass and drive the van and the van is broken so here we go <laughs> here we go and uh, she uses she her pronouns what does the van look like and what does uh, vicky look like vicky looks cool and hot and that's as far as i've narrowed it down uh cool. imagine that's someone who's cool and hot got it uh and in terms of her van it is the shape of the scooby-doo mystery machine it is not colored like the mystery machine but it is mm, oh i'm googling 1970s vans and there's so many (laughs) ugly ones it's amazing i think it is bright it is bright orange yeah Uh, gorgeous colors all scratched up so it's kind of failed faded a little bit but quite bright orange uh, orange still all right, but here's my final question to you. I appreciate it. Suddenly there's like on the spot questioning, mm. but it's the most important one of this whole one shot. What is your van called? Oh. oh. You've asked the right person this. <laughs> you have. Um, Marlene. Oh, Marlene. perfect. Beautiful. I love her. She's a beautiful lady. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Ellie, would you like to go next, please? Hi, I'm Ellie. I use she, her, or they, them pronouns. I will be playing Rupert Kingsley, brother of Vicky. He uses he, him pronouns. His archetype is the fool. And he is the director of the indie horror that we're going to be filming today. Mm -hmm. Uh, The horror is written, penned by him. Uh, It's called, it stalks in the night. And um, it's, it looks like it's, it, it's kind of about horror, but it's actually more about the horror of existence um, and society, <laughs> and it's very bad. Rupert, I suppose, looks like a shadow of his older sister. Less hot. Less hot. <laughs> doesn't um, own a van. <laughs> doesn't own a van. Can't drive. You guys are really serving like secret history vibes with your characters. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I feel like there's a little bit of old money about both of them. Mm. Maybe not like super old money, but but kind of moneyed in in any case. And I think where Vicky is like hot, as Katie put it, like and probably very buff. Oh, absolutely. Very very buff and like kind of has like a kind of magnetism and yeah, about mm-hmm. her i think rupert is quite like gaunt mm. they're probably about the same height maybe maybe he's like a, a fraction taller mm-hmm. and he's just kind of a little bit scruffy he's definitely wearing a turtleneck yeah. and he's yep. just a culmination of all of the worst film bros i have met uh <laughs> in my teen and adult life and let's just say there's too many <laughs> Does Rupert have a uh, backwards baseball cap on? Ooh, did they wear that in the seventies? I don't know. I guess because my my question to you, because like you said, like they they have this sort of status, they have this sort of energy about them, uh, about Rupert. So I just wondered if, there, if there's something that like you use as sort of like a crutch, perhaps. So that's why I always assume with people mm. who, who have a lot of things out that hiding behind. If you're not if you're not super handsome like your sister, uh... <laughs> maybe I feel like he'd be more of a beret kind of guy, oh, and I think he is hiding his receding hairline, like oh, his hairline no. that's receding just a little bit too much for a twenty. Now let's not <laughs> knock men who are twenty <laughs> in their mid twenties with receding hairlines. It's Agreed. nothing to do with them or who they are as people. No, no, it's absolutely not. I am knocking a particular individual I know. So. Uh, <laughs> This is a personal vendetta, not a generalisation, I promise. Vicky wears a really cool leather jacket. Of course she does. 
Does Rupert wear the directorial scarf? Oh, yes. <laughs> there you go. With the turtleneck. I feel like Rupert would be a big fan of Goddard. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. The oh, way yeah. you're describing him. Uh, Jean-Luc, yeah. <laughs> Last but by no means least, uh, Am, can you please go for it? Hello, my name is Am, and I use she/her pronouns. As does my character, Laurie Curtis. Laurie is a whisper of a person. You could compare her to a ghost. She's quite pale. Uh, she's got big, thick, round glasses. She's very mm-hmm. slight. Uh, wispy, I think, is probably the best way to describe her. And most people couldn't tell you what her face looked like uh, because they forget it as right after oh. they looked at it. Um, <laughs> she has a spray of freckles and mm. a, a short sort of dirty blonde bob. And she is the scholar. She is the tech techie of the um, little film crew. Mm-hmm. She's a bit of a scaredy cat, not a fan of horror, even though she does love movies and film. Mm-hmm. So she is quite unhappy to be here. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, if she, you, you want to get uh, started in the film business... You kind of have to take every opportunity you get. I guess my question for you, uh, uh, Laurie, I don't want to like typecast you as a scholar who has a book, but I mm. assume you have something on you, maybe like a notebook or, or maybe something that is related to your field of expertise, like something, what would that be? A sort of like, an, not an artifact, it's, it's something like a role play thing that I'm thinking of. Uh, I feel you. I am just checking publication year because i think i know pretty much exactly which book it would be <laughs> uh, you gotta be historically accurate in our role play game it's uh joseph campbell's the hero's journey oh, oh nice okay. classic okay. wow i've yeah. heard about that and i know nothing about film i personally prefer john york's into the woods uh how stories work and why we tell them but that's just mm. me <laughs> yeah so laurie probably carries that around like a bible yeah, probably like uh, like thumbed through, maybe mm. bent a little bit. Uh, Post-it notes, notes, coffee yeah. stains, yeah. Yeah, you got it. As, yeah, it is your little Bible. Um, the book is not called The Hero's Journey. It's called The Hero with a Thousand Faces, and it was published in 1949. <laughs> well, <laughs> the Hero's like... Journey is the main concept that is relevant it's here. It's introduced, though, it? yeah, 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 yeah. I love that. You well actually lead yourself there, so good job. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. All right, well... With all that out of the way, I'm going to do the setting scene, the opening scene. So, it is 1975. Stranded with a broken down Marlene, you are stuck in the middle of nowhere. All that surrounds you is fields and paddocks as far as the eye can see, and to make matters worse, it's getting dark. The only sign of life for many miles appears to be an old farm up the hill. Making your way in search of a phone, finding some gas, and maybe some directions means you'll be taking a trip through the cornfields that surround you. So I want you to imagine that you are all, uh, you've all piled out of Marlene. Uh, she's smoking slightly, which is always a bad sign. And you can just see all around you are these cornfields. Think proper American flatland. These corn uh, up to your height. You know, up to your eye, essentially. But in the far distance, like maybe one of you sort of points out there is a farmhouse with a light on. What would you folks like to do? Vicky is going to go around to the back and get a big torch out. One of them kind of big torches that security guards carry about. Mm-hmm. Of course, she's yep. got one in the back. <sighs> Jeez, Vicky, I thought you said that this was a good van. It's the van I could afford <sighs> if you wanted to, you know, contribute to buying me a new van. Or pay me for being here. Just ask Dad for some money. It's not that hard. I'm not even going to go and explain to you all the ways I'm I'm not going to do that. <sighs> well, can you fix it or what? Oh, uh, yeah, I am not a mechanic. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, it does not look too good to me. Uh, you, 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 the techie, right? You you might yes. know how to do something Laurie. with this. Laurie, um, right, yeah. Cameras and cars are very different. No, I... I know that, but I thought, you know, you're kind of hands-on. That might be something Um, that's kind of in your ability. Like, you're a practical person. I'm an artist. Yeah, you fix things, right? You fix this. Uh, I'm going to make a roll, I guess. Yes, fantastic. So, yes, uh, you can see, uh, going towards the uh, car itself, I need you to make a smart check for me, please. Can I use one of my subclass moves? Uh, Yeah, read it out. What does it say? Uh, This is one for the academic, um, because I've taken engineer and academic. Uh, the game's afoot. Add plus one talent die to your dice pool when making a smarts check to investigate your surroundings. Perfect. That sounds good to me. So yeah, add. Uh, so you will roll 
your smarts, which is your core dice for that, and your talent one, and add one more talent to it as well. It says two symbols. successes, one strange, and then some symbols. So you can see that on the left you have two successes because in your uh, smarts check you got one smart, so that's the yellow symbol, and then in your talent die you have a talent symbol there as well, so that will add to your success. So you have succeeded because the, the check for this was having two successes. You sort of go around, you sort of lift up the hood and the smoke pours out. You can hear it almost like coughing slightly, slightly dying. And with maybe uh, Vicky looking over your shoulder, you can see it's knackered, but it is repairable. You think you need some sort of tool to make it sort of fix it up, you know, tighten a few bits and pieces, and you definitely need fuel. Vicky, you probably think back to your uh, looking at the um, the fuel gauge, and you know that you know you've hit it a few times, uh, and it sort of wildly guesstimates how much fuel is in it. So it wouldn't surprise you that it's, there is no fuel. Yeah. Okay. So we need to go get some fuel. There's well, we're in the middle of nowhere. I saw the farmhouse. Well, I don't know. I don't know what really a farmhouse looked like. It's a building. You know, this might actually. Hang on, hang on. Let me just take in the atmosphere. Here we go. I don't, don't scoff. There's a method to my madness. It's you know, it's how the greats <laughs> do it. You know, you've got to capitalize on these opportunities. You know, actually, Fiona, what time of day did you say it was? Uh, it is getting dark, so this was. You probably were scouting for a couple of hours. Maybe yeah. you're on the way back from a location, uh, and then you broke down. So you think it's r- getting towards the evening time currently. I'm gonna like put my hand up as Rupert's talking. Uh, he's gonna ignore you and carry on. So, um, um so I Rupert, think Rupert, so maybe what we should do Rupert, is capitalize Rupert, on this. Um, Rupert, Midi wants to talk. Yeah. Okay. Don't interrupt me though, just because I'm the director and I. Yeah, like I know that you're kind of new at this, but generally speaking, like the director is the person who. Let her talk. God, it's just that. Um, well, uh, as it's dusk, um, the light will change too fast for us to get any more than one take for a scene. Well, then we better get on get on with it. I don't. Th- <laughs> okay. Why don't we do like a run up to the farmhouse no. or something? Mm. Two birds, one stone. We can get some good film in. Yeah, I'm vetoing maybe that. Could, maybe some B roll of running. We don't actually have anything. We don't need oh, to get anything on, today. Vicky. You said we didn't need to get anything today. Vicky, don't be such a square. We we've no, but we've got to capitalize on this. Look. Lucy, if you just run in front of the camera, Laurie, set up the set up the camera. We'll do like a running shot. You just look really scared, like you're running from something, and then we can go. To okay, the how about you lot stay here, and I'll go and check out that building and see if they've got any petrol. Um, I don't think it's a good idea for us to split up. Yeah, well, so, and exactly, Vicky. What I'm saying is, well, I don't think any of you are going to be helpful to me. So well, hang on, hang on, hang on. If we if we do the shot run up to the farmhouse and then we can when we finish the take we can knock on the door see if anyone's got any fuel two birds one stone i'm going now you can do what you want all right but if you ruin this shot i will hold it against you personally forever by the time you get this shot set up i will be gone Uh, i would like lucy to make for me a wits check because i think you sort of waiting around maybe chewing your gum a little bit you're not as engaged with the conversation oh no she's Mm. just waiting to be told what to do exactly Vicky is going to die. <laughs> Vicky is going and doing something. Laurie is looking like very torn between staying here with the person who has effectively given her a job or going with the very clearly physically strongest person in the group. <laughs> I rolled one success. So as you're sort of chatting away, as you're hearing them sort of argue between themselves, should we go up to the farmhouse? No, oh, let's get the take in now. Oh, I think we should stay here. You hear a rustle in the corn behind you. You spin around, but you don't see anything. Just endless rows of corn. Hey, Rupert. Yeah, what, yes? There are animals in these fields. I mean, I guess there's bound to be. Oh, God. I don't like animals. It, uh, yeah, but it's part of the experience, okay? You've just kind of got to suck it up with these things, all yeah, right? I know, I know. In the film I that I did before, I had a girl working with maggots on her. So, you know, you kind of... This is sort of an easy ride in comparison. Why did you oh. put maggots on her? Oh. It was part of the horror. Anyway, look. Laurie, <laughs> set up the take. We'll do the run up to the farmhouse, and then we can actually get help while we're, while we're filming. Bye. I'm I'm starting to walk up to the farmhouse. I will start to set everything up. All right, good to know. Lucy spits her gum out into her hand and sticks it behind her ear. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> All right, the party's splitting up already. 
brilliant um so what i would say you uh looking at it uh vicky the farmhouse is quite far away and why why i say it's a farm is that you can see, sort of spot even from this distance it's probably a mile or so away there is like a small building uh with like a what looks like a, a barn next to it silhouetted against sort of the, the dying light as well as like one of those silos you can see as well um but currently you can't see a track close by maybe you walk up and down the road a little bit whilst the other people are setting up uh for the for the shot but you think you're going to have to go through the corn to get there so are you doing that uh will you let me have some kind of weaponry in my van what were you what are you thinking something like a baseball bat that's like plausible deniability of it not being to attack people with that you might keep around in your van if you were uh, a woman who does a lot of driving alone in the 1970s. I'll tell you what, I want you to roll me a smarts check. Whether she was prepared. Yeah, because okay. you have been dragged out by your brother to go on this location. Uh, soon. So what I would say, this is with a minor disadvantage. So what that means, folks, is advantage, disadvantage is slightly different in Shiver. A minor disadvantage is that you take one of your core dice out to a minimum of one for the roll. Okay, well, I had a smarts of four, so I'm down to three. Mm-hmm. And now I'm rolling it. Uh, zero success is too strange. Too strange. Oh, oh no. Oh, it, it begins. <laughs> Excellent. Tell me um, if Katie's going to die first. Yeah. <laughs> she never gets a die first. One. That is brilliant. Okay. Um, so annoyingly, I think you might have been having a clear out of your van or something like that because uh, there's no tools here either. So you got to oh, maybe I could take a tool or something to, you know, you don't have anything credible like a baseball bat or a uh, like a jack or anything like that, unfortunately. Well, I got this torch. Yeah, you do have a torch. You're not. You're not that. You're not that silly. Except you always need a torch for these situations. Of course you do. Basic safety. Have a cup torch in your vehicle, isn't it? Um, okay. You heading off into the court? Yeah. All right. All right. If you lot don't come with me, then stay by the car. Stay where you are. Don't go running off. Okay. I've got to run for the shop. Well, come with me then. Oh, oh just, 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 just ignore her. She doesn't understand the craft. Now, Lucy, if you just, if when, when I say action, just run right through the cornfield. Look like you're being chased by something. In fact, Laurie, can we do like a, uh, can we do like a mounted run? Can, can you get the camera on your shoulder and just run after her? <laughs> um, okay, okay. Awesome, great. Is that possible with high crank cameras? Well, it's gonna matter, figure it doesn't out matter today. if it's possible, right? Yeah. It doesn't matter if it's possible. It's what it's what the director it's wants. What the director, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Rupert doesn't know if it's possible or not. <laughs> okay. Um, I would then suggest that for Lucy, I'd like you to roll me a heart check because you're acting, uh-huh. uh, and then for poor Laurie, uh, I want you to roll me a wits check as you're trying to follow behind where uh, um, Lucy has sort of left you. Okie dokie. And action. Two successes on the heart deck. Zero successes, one strange. Oh, oh God. Um, it's pretty convincing. Uh, you were born for this role as the final girl. Um, did we come up with a name for your character? In- no. Evangeline. I was going to say I wanted to lead up to Ellie. <laughs> oh, my God. Evangeline. <laughs> so, yeah, you portray Evangeline, like, screaming, running through the, the corn... Uh, yeah, and then poor, poor uh, Laurie is behind, getting stuck because these these bits of corn. Um, if you've ever walked in cornfields, yeah, it's quite it's quite thick, and so trying to get through, it's not very very close to you, but it, it's just taking a lot of effort to get through. So you are currently slowed, and you sort of almost lose Lucy in the corn itself. Uh, Rupert, are you following along behind? Yeah, he's he's not like making an effort to sort of keep up in terms of, like, actively jogging, but he's sort of sauntering behind, making his way through the cornfield, trying to make it look really casual and effortless, but obviously it's, like, getting slapped in the face with by bits of corn. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, can you roll for me a wits check as well with a minor disadvantage? Because, yeah, unfortunately you're trying to be, like, play it off, but obviously these people are running ahead of you. So when I roll that, does that mean I have to change my number to two briefly? Uh, yes. So uh, yeah. So the yeah minor disadvantage means you take one core skill die out of your pool for this okay. check. Mm-hmm. Zero success is too strange. Oh my god! Right. Right. <laughs> Me are, as they say, rolling like garbage. You all of you make it into the cornfield itself, and it's it's a. <laughs> 
I just feel so sorry for Vicky, who's just sort of rushing ahead a little bit. <laughs> and behind you, like, it's, it's almost like you're trying to stealth ahead and the three of them behind are, like, making a lot of noise. Um, <laughs> screaming, <laughs> you know, camera whirring, because it's probably a, quite a big camcorder. And, yeah, like, and you just hear it often, like, oh, shit, fuck, as, like, various corn is hitting Rupert in the face. <laughs> <laughs> it's what he deserves. As I said, there doesn't seem to be a clear path uh, so which, and so you just make you go through some openings through the dense cornfields in front of you and as you sort of brush aside some of the stalks i would say for you vicky you sort of get there first you enter a small clearing and you you sort of push the stalks aside you enter the small clearing the stalks in this clearing have been pushed flat they are now brittle yeah. and brown forming a circle and at its center strapped to a tall wooden frame is a scarecrow with a wrinkled pumpkin for a head carved in a, with a fixed, sinister grin with jagged teeth. In its right hand, it clutches a long scythe, and on top of its head is a drooping, broad brim hat. A wooden sign with crude, crudely carved arrow points towards the hill, reading Corn Fallow Farm. Oh, that's creepy. Ugh. So you say, did he say a scythe? Uh, a scythe, yes. Like, one of, uh, you know, one of those Grim yeah. Reaper things, yeah. yeah. Huh, I'm trying to decide whether whether Vicky's creeped out enough to t- try and acquire weaponry. Um, well, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, why don't you now make for me a fear check? So this is when you roll your strange pool, and you need to beat a one. So yeah, you need to get one success for your strange. That is unlikely. She's only mm-hmm. got a two for strange. She cannot be having with the bullshit. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, I'm rolling. Oh, zero successes, zero strange. Oh, but both of them are a luck thing. What does that mean? Oh, so you've got, you got two luck symbols currently. Mm-hmm. So with that, you can either use two luck to have an automatic success. You can bank one of the looks so you have a luck point on your next one. Or you can use two luck to take one minute back from the doom clock. I think I'd like to bank them. Okay, so you bank one luck for you. But you have failed your check. So what I'm saying is that currently you are afraid of the scarecrow in in this vicinity just now. There's something about it that is eerie and creepy. So for the following scene, that with this creature within your eyesight, you have a minus one core uh, dice skill on all of your core skills, essentially. So just keep that in mind. As you're sort of looking up at this creature, the rest of the team sort of uh, barrel in uh, behind them. You hear uh, Lucy screaming away, Laurie obviously ah, 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 with the camera, and eventually Rupert going, oh, fuck, as being hit on the head by a final mm. uh, straw stalk. Um, but yeah, you're all in it, and you all see the sight of the scarecrow with a pumpkin head. Ah! cut. Hey Ruru, is this creepy and atmospheric enough for you? Oh, this is perfect. Oh my goodness, what what an amazing stroke of luck. Laurie. It's creepy as hell. Exactly, it's perfect. Laurie, do you want to just film some, <laughs> some, some bits of it? Do some more shaky camera work. Just do whatever you're doing already. Just do that, but in front of the scarecrow. I'm carrying on. Harry Waxman didn't have to deal with this. <laughs> I'm going to where we're supposed to be going. All right, just as long as you don't get in the shot, you'll stay out of the way. Okay, jeez, I'll get out of his shot. Okay. Vicky, can you make for me a wits check? Wits, okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, do I have a minus one to this? You do currently, yes, because you okay. are afraid. Uh, let's see, wit... Zero successes, one strange. Oh, strange clock ticks. Ever ticks mm. on. Um... You, you like as you're talking. You think you hear in the corn stalks like the sound of something snapping. But you look round, and yeah, it's just the call on the wind. Probably nothing. Chill out, Vicky. Chill out. Can you not <sighs> make any noise, Vicky? It's kind of hard to cut it out in post. Sorry, Laurie. Do you want to take that again? Um. Uh, okay. Um. I'm just gonna try my best to get some good shots. Yeah. Sure. Make for me a smarts check. Ooh, four successes. Whoa. Damn. And another oh look gosh. symbol. Apparently, uh, me, I take the most beautiful, life-changing... <laughs> Transformative. You have got a critical success because you've got two or more than the actual thing. Let me look at what that actually means. Um, Lucy's spending most of this time, like, side-eyeing Rupert and Laurie because she's kind of noticing that Laurie's a bit, like, uh, out of breath and stuff. But also, uh, she doesn't want to get in the way because she can't be bothered. 
Um, but she's kind of clocking that and like looking between them. Rupert is absolutely misinterpreting this as uh, Lucy being jealous of the fact that he's paying attention to Laurie because he thinks you're both in love with him. <laughs> yep. <laughs> that, that absolutely cracks. <laughs> what I would like then from you, Lucy, is to also make me a wits check as well. Sure. That is zero successes and zero strange. Phew. It's all fine. Uh, again, I think you're just you're just a bit tired of this. You've been in a very cramped van all day, having to listen to Rupert whittle on about his grand vision. And it's a bit. He will absolutely be giving you lectures about how Evangeline represents innocence and how you need to convey that appropriately. Is he giving me notes that contradict each other? Yes. Good. Oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> speak with your eyes but also your mouth can you yeah. be like sad but also like excited like sad excited yeah, yeah. Like, that's the energy of this scene amazing um unfortunately uh the your, your the super success critical thing doesn't really apply for this one but what i will say for <laughs> you laurie is yeah you now have at your disposal at any time in this one shot uh in your inventory if you wish to put it there uh the perfect shot of this scarecrow um, <laughs> you bring up at any time. That's amazing. Again, you're just sort of, oh, God's sake, you know, you you want you you know you you're thinking about your evening plans, which you've probably had. Well, you would have cancelled uh, anyway because you were you were expected to do like a big film today. Didn't happen. But uh, so the three of you are you are you three remaining by the scarecrow uh, whilst uh, whilst Vicky's on their way off. I'm trying to stick to Vicky as much as possible, but also not get in trouble with Rupert. <laughs> I think once we get this shot, we can we I'd can say, go. Laurie, to, to maybe accommodate that, maybe you sort of do a 360 shot and then back into the, the cord on the other yeah. side. I think that Lucy's maybe just wandering around a little bit, still keeping like within uh, 10 feet or so of mm -hmm. the others, but she's not needed for this shot, so she's kind of looking for somewhere to put her energy. And so it's kind of just wandering around, keeping an eye on Vicky, Easy maybe. Enough. Uh, again, looking through, you can see that night is starting to fall quite fast now. And actually looking ahead past where Vicky is sort of heading towards, you can see that sort of farmhouse, barn and the silo. But you now see, and all of you can see this at this point, I will say, there is a light coming from one of the upstairs windows. Come on, let's go borrow some something. All right, it, it... Are we done with this? Yeah, yeah. That looked stunning, Laurel. Um, let's... Uh, Laurie. Let's... Sorry? My name's Laurie. That's what I said, yeah. Um, My name can be Laurel, it's okay. Yeah, see, Laurel gets it. No, your name's Laurie. Anyway, let's, yeah. Uh, let's head over to the house and find some fuel or something. Um, I think they probably will have fuel because farms have um, um, tra tractors and, and such and they need fuel. I think they have, like, different fuel though, right? All engines are pretty much the same. This is all being, like, pedantic over things that don't really matter and kind of bore me a little bit. So uh, let's carry on, shall we? <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah, pedantic, huh? Wonder what that looks like. Yeah, so you understand this is a sort of fruitless conversation. It's not like it's something that you girls would know much about anyway, so let's just carry on. Look, can we just go? Yeah, let's, let me go in, we're going. <laughs> just ignore everything he's ever said. It's what I do. It works quite well for me. <laughs> so you continue going through the cornfield. I would like everyone again to make me a wits check as you're trying to get through the cornfield itself i'd say you are navigating because i know somebody here has an ability to navigate i do i get a plus one talent die when navigating there you go am i still afraid uh, as soon as you leave that sort of circle and you carry on maybe a couple of meters or so out of uh you're uh, not looking at it you start your breath you realize you were holding your breath Okay. And you're like, oh, creepy. And then you continue away, so you are no longer afraid. Can I use... Uh, so I have two luck points, uh, so can I use them to succeed on this? Uh, you should only have one luck point because your archetype isn't... Uh, you can only have a bank one, but yes, you can definitely have use oh. that. In that case, one. I would like to use that. So how does using the luck work? So for those people who aren't uh, a fool, <laughs> the fool <laughs> archetype can bank up to three. Uh, everyone else can only bank one. But essentially, you can use uh, it on your next roll or in, on a future roll to add just one success to the final roll, essentially. I've got three successes, and then I've also got the two stars. 
um so talent that that's five successes in total Ooh. it should it should say actually what how many successes you've got um just, yeah, it's just the three because i've got the one wit and then the two stars that makes sense yeah there you go i have two successes nice and i used my luck to get one success one success that is one success uh and zero strange and i've got a luck but i can't bank any more luck because i've already got a luck that's why i used my luck it's because i rolled one so i'm like i can use it and then bank it exactly yeah you unfortunately yeah you you've got to use it or you lose it that's the thing so yeah it's quite a task going up the hill not just because rupert is wittering on about various shots uh and various like grand designs and grand things say oh well you know if we had the budget um it is quite a steep hill and the corn itself, it's it's moving and swaying on a sort of almost non-existent breeze a little bit. So Rupert, you're going, yes, yes, yes. You know, well, in my head, I would put it as maybe, I don't know, maybe like about 4D, you know, really, really, ha- <laughs> like really invest in that. And as you say that, something just out of the corner of your eye shifts slightly. Uh, some sort of a bigger form shifts a little bit and you look and it looks to be you think you can make out a shape uh, for a moment a mere moment a figure taller and gaunter than a man and the corn sort of sways in the breeze obscuring your view for a moment and with that you look at you maybe blink and it, it's gone there wasn't anything there uh, hello did, did you guys see that see what it looked like there was not quite a man, but some something. I don't know. Maybe someone in a costume or something. I, I can't see them anymore. Did you did you hire anyone in a costume? No, no, I didn't have the budget <laughs> for a costume. Well, you were expensive. Uh, I didn't sign up to multi role list if this is one of your visions. No, no, no. I, 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 ignore me. Um, I don't know. It must have just been a trick of the light. Let, let's uh, let's keep going. Well, you know your brain. It's full of twigs up there. <laughs> Don't uh, underestimate my uh, my artistic temperament. Your imagination. It's not my imagination. I, anyway, d- oh, no. you agree you have no imagination then? Excellent, no. Vicky. And so the siblings continue their argument, <laughs> and the rest of you. You didn't see a figure. You didn't see anything. All you heard was the the corn, you know, gently moving and rustling in the wind. Uh, but then you all make it out. And you make it to the farm itself. So you push the stalks aside, you spy the farm, and it looks quite run down. The paint chipped and buildings seem to lean at odd angles. There's a rusted windmill that creaks in the night air. To your left uh, is a barn. It's red paint flaking like a like a, a dried flaking sort of maybe like skin of some sort. Long grasses shooting up around the, its perimeter. On your right is the farmhouse, a wooden building with a broad porch. From the state of it, you'd assume it has been abandoned, but, as I said before, there is a light upstairs. In between the barn and the farmhouse sits the windmill, a grain silo towering above it into the night sky. What would you guys like to do? I'm going to go right up to the farmhouse and knock on the door. I was going to say the same thing. thing. Excellent. Three of you, march forward, fearless. Um, (laughs) What would Laurie be doing? She is beelining after Vicky. Excellent. So all as one... You make your way up to the farmhouse uh, porch, and it is quite run down uh, as you get there. Um, who's knocking on the door? Me. Hello? Anyone there? That was satirical. I know someone's there. Hi, we need help with something. As you knock on the door, uh, the door creaks open, like, and it opens off into a quite dark room damn you people should lock your doors i think it's been abandoned vix there's a light upstairs well someone could have left a light on and then left the house ages ago uh i guess but i don't think it's properly abandoned the electricity Um, wouldn't have been working someone would need to be paying the electric bills or putting stuff in a generator yeah yeah does it matter thank you i'm going in i've got my torch I know a friend who's a security guard who they, they, they carry these big torches and it means they can hit someone with it if they need to. Oh, Vicky, no one cares. Look, let's just find some fuel and get out of here. Yeah, it's getting cold. Well, there's plenty of stuff to burn if we need to. Um, I'm going to start looking around, see if I can find any kind of fuel. Can I go in? Is there anyone inside? Uh, you can't currently see anyone. What I will say is it's kind of up to you. you obviously, you've got the farmhouse there. 
I think it would be a smart check to find something. Um, you can help each other. It's called assisting. I know there's somebody here that has a. I can't a, assist people. You, well, you can, but it's at minor disadvantage. I think it's what your I, ability I is. I can't assist on skill checks, and, and if I'm working together with somebody, I'll have a minor disadvantage. So yeah, so you would go. You would probably go by yourself then. Yeah. All right. So if you do for me a, uh, let's go for a smarts check. Uh, Rupert, I know you were looking for fuel. Yes. Uh, also do for me a smart check. I'm running mine with luck. All right, good to know. I've got one successes uh, and one strange, plus luck is two successes. Nice, two I've successes. Got two successes as well. Two successes, fantastic. Uh, so yeah, easy enough. For Vicky, you go in and you start to look around with your the aid of your you know, big, big F-offs flashlight, which is always useful in horror films. You slowly go around and look at things. And the furniture here is definitely dilapidated. Uh, some of it is rotting slightly. There's definitely a smell of damp as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, you do find quite a few bits and pieces in the kitchen. So the, the, you find like some rusty like kitchen knives. You've got like maybe a cleaver, uh, various things. But you don't find any tools that will help you with the car. And you don't find any fuel. Going to Rupert, you suspect... Hmm, the fuel itself would not be kept in the house. You'd probably be in the barn. So maybe that's where you go. So I'd give you that from that. And you don't find cool. any fuel, but you know where it is. Can I take the cleaver? Absolutely. And I will give you the stats for that in a second. Laurie, uh, what were you doing? I um, would like to do one of my uh, architect moves, um, which is improviser. Cobble together an improvised melee weapon. Uh, smarts check. The number of smarts determines the weapon's quality and power. Sounds good to me. Uh, I got one success. Nice. Um, yeah, so I think she's kind of just like looking for, recognizing the situation that they're in. Abandoned house, but there's a light on. Mm-hmm. Things are a bit creepy. The paranoid uh, person in her is, is kind of like, you should have something that can hit something, I think. Maybe you do like a Wolverine style thing. You find all the cutlery and you're like, Pfft. yeah. Put put it around your uh, things. All right, I'll come back to you with what those what that weapon is in a second. Ah, uh, going to uh, Lucy. What are you doing, my friend? I think I would march straight up to where the or if I can up to where the light was on. Oh Excellent. God! Sort of yeah. calling out. I'm just kidding. hello, hello. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, <laughs> could you make for me a heart check then? Yes. Oh no. Zero oh, no. successes, even though I have five dice. Oh, no. Wow. Zero strange, though. No strange. Oh, lucky. Lucky on that front. All right. So my big question is, is Rupert splitting off from the group currently to go find fuel? Oh, God. Sure. Yes. Yes. Yay. All right. <laughs> cool. Let's well, kill him. We'll come back to Rupert in a second, because um, I like the idea. Nobody, nobody noticed that Rupert has gone until it's a little bit too late. I think he perhaps. is going to loudly announce it, but I don't think anyone's paying attention. Perfect. We're I so think... used to tuning him out. Exactly. Yeah. I think that's great. So, um, Lucy, you start to you you go like hello, you know, you, and you can see actually looking up the stairs to this uh, farmhouse, you can see there is a light coming from the stairs. So you sort of make your way up as the stairs itself creaks a little bit. And you start to head up there. The other two, what I'd say for the moment, you are sort of preparing your weapons. You're finding stuff and bits and pieces just to, just in case. You know, you both maybe look at each other, Laurie and Vicky, and like, it's fine. Uh, but as you prepare sort of your weapons and stuff. So, yeah, you've got the your improvised smart weapons. ones. Right, exactly. Does my cleaver count as a knife? Just the stats for it. Is this kind of knife for it or is it an improvised weapon? I'm going to put it as an improvised weapon because as you pick it up, it's a little bit jagged because um, I, couldn't, I couldn't find the knife one in the end. <laughs> there doesn't seem to have any knives in here. That's weird. Mm, you think weird. knife would be the basic weapon? Oh, well. I just want to say how funny I find it that the screenshot you sent is improvised weapon, and immediately underneath is laser, laser sword. sword. I know. Sorry, <laughs> not for this one shot. <laughs> not quite the vibe. Yeah, sadly. Um, v- Vicky. Oh yeah. Um, I just I thought it was really cool the way that you uh stuck up for us with. Rupert, thank you. Look, you need to just stop trying to be deferential. He's an idiot. I, I how <laughs> much he's paying you is not enough. Just oh, he's not paying me. Oh, he's not paying you. <laughs> no, this is for okay. experience and exposure. <laughs> oh. I am so sorry. Uh, 
I don't have the money to pay you myself, but I will buy you a beer later. If you want a beer, I don't know. Oh, um, yeah. I, would, I, mean, I, I, would, buy. I, would... I work at a bouncer at a club, so I actually oh. can get free drinks. But I can get you a free drink, is my point. I mean, I I would like that very much. Um, okay. Thank you. It is... Oh, I, can't, I can't think of any good names for clubs. Um, Whilst you think of a good name for a club, um, <laughs> we, go, we go back to Lucy. So you, Lucy, again, by yourself, you sort of open the door to an old bedroom. And again, dilapidated. You see those damp on the walls a little bit. But straight across from you, you see the window which you were looking out of. And then you can see that there is a... Uh, next to the window, there's almost like a, a gas light, perhaps, you know, one of those old fashioned sort of gas lights with the sort of the light, sort of the flame sort of flickering a little bit. And... Rupert would be very familiar. <laughs> oh, yes. Of course, and... referring to the Hitchcock movie Gaslight. <laughs> Thank you. And then there is a rocking chair and in the rocking chair facing away from you looks like to be an older lady, slowly but surely just slightly rocking back and forth. Oh. Hello. Uh Sorry to disturb you. We're looking for fuel. Our van broke down. The rocking stops. Like, with a sudden, like, Err. and you, she sort of turns around slowly. Her head sort of turns around. And you do see it is a, an old lady. She looks like she's in her sort of 70s. Her silvery grey hair, a little bit tousled, is is tied up in a bun. And she's like, oh, your, your van. I have sorry to hear. Um... Yeah, I, there might be some bits in the barn. Oh, I mean, we can go have a look, if that's okay. I, um, you... Are you alright? You, you came alone? <laughs> well, there's four of us. Right. It's, I, sorry, it's been, it's been quite some time since people came here. Right. Um... How long have you been here? Well, I, this is my farm. This is Corn Fallow Farm. I've been here, well, I've been in charge of it since since Ernie passed. And she laps into silence a little bit. I'm going to try and read her mind. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, that sounds good. All right, so what, what's this like, ability? Yeah, like, Tell us all about it. I am telepathic because, of course, why not? Uh, you can attempt to probe someone's inner thoughts using the power of your mind. Roll a strange check. The mm -hmm. CR is equal to half the target character's heart core skill points rounded down. Well, I guess you can just decide. Mm -hmm. uh, and if I succeed, I can ask the director three questions as you probe into their thoughts. I got one success only. Nice. And they... That's fine. That's all you needed because... Uh, it ticks she... the Zoom clock up by one minute. Oh no, what a shame. Oh, no. What a shame. What a shame. <laughs> All right, you are currently at seven minutes past. All right, so you um, take a moment. Like, just describe for me the flavor of this for me. Like, how do you probe this uh, old, old dear's mind? I think um, this is the sort of thing that uh, Lucy doesn't do on the regular. Mm -hmm. She's only doing it now because everything is weird. Mm -hmm. And so she kind of leans against because she's still standing in the door mm -hmm. and she kind of leans a little against the doorway and tries to look casual <laughs> like crosses her arms mm -hmm. and is gonna continue to kind of talk to her but it's mostly just like explaining how what the weather was like on the journey something completely benign right. um, that she doesn't have to think about mm -hmm. so she can like hone in on her thoughts psychically Nice, I like that. Yeah, so you're sort of maybe doing that bit of small talk, saying, oh yeah, we, we got here, we're actually on location, we're trying to find out, you know, uh, we've got you know, Rupert, you know, and you're talking about the, the journey sort of all while sort of like diving in and seeing if that gets any prompts. Mm. And you do get some prompts. You hear um, almost like whispers a little bit, like again, it's that maybe that voiceover effect you see in TV, right? You hear the lady's voice as she said, oh well, the, the crops weren't growing so well. And, and and keeping it going was a challenge ever since Ernie died. Oh, but then but then I, I you know, I kept on. I I, I made myself uh, keep going, you know, for Ernie's sake and because the farm was so important to him. I even made a scarecrow. You know, oh it's an ugly little thing, you know, it's it's 
It made of old sacks, has a pumpkin for a head. I even gave it a name. I even called it Mr. Husk. Oh, but it didn't stop the birds. Oh. It didn't stop the birds. And one day they got them real bad, and I, I just sat there and cried. But then the next day, the next day the birds, they, they were gone. And and there was just bundles of produce on the on the porch. And now you see sort of, again, almost like flashes of images you know, of her opening the door, seeing like these uh, piles of corn being placed in sort of like beautifully wrapped sort of things. And then maybe a bushel of apples and all that sort of thing. And I thought I thought I had a guardian angel. I thought maybe my Ernie had come back. Oh, but then it all changed after the Watson boys came. And then you again moves ahead. You see it's late now, and you see it. She wakes up in bed. And the sounds of crashing outside as the local sort of layabouts, these troublemakers, the Watson boys, are coming and playing havoc with the barn. And she sort of you know goes to reach out and tell them to go away. For suddenly in the night, she just again that sort of that film thing where she's looking through the window and there's a horrible shadow looms up and something like as something with a sigh cuts down these two boys. Oh God. I saw him. I saw him. It was, it was Mr. Husk with a, with a scythe in one hand, dragging those boys behind the other. He looked up at me, and I swear, that awful pumpkin face smiled at me. At that point, the the benign chatter begins to just, like, trail off. As Oh, it, it died 30 seconds ago, yeah. Yeah, as, uh, like, Lucy's completely focused on this mm-hmm. and hasn't even realised she stopped talking. Mm-hmm. And it's just kind of staring at this woman. Like she is eyes with you, and she was like, "You know, you've seen him. He's here. Oh, he protects the land. You must be careful. He doesn't like trespassers. Certainly not in the barn." No. <laughs> no. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Oh, no. We're going to take a quick break. <laughs> Have our troupe of would-be filmmakers stumbled upon the next big creature feature? Or are they starring in their own slasher film to end all slasher films? Find out next time on What Am I Rolling? The What Am I Rolling podcast was created, recorded and edited by me, Fiona Howard. This episode's players were Chloe... Katie, Ellie, and Am, the cast of Decker Many Aces. Be sure to check out Decker Many Aces, an actual play DD podcast made by actual asexuals and aromantics, wherever you listen to podcasts. This episode's RPG was Shiver, the award winning tabletop role playing game bringing tales of the mysterious, the peculiar, and the strange to life. You can find out more information about Shiver and check out other Parable Game products on their website. That's www.parablegames.co.uk. The theme music was 8 Bit March by Twin Musicon of twinmusicon.org, licensed under a Creative Commons 4.0 license. If you want to find out more about the podcast, check out the website. That's www.wairpodcast.com. Fancy getting in touch? Email the podcast at whatamirollingpodcast at gmail.com. Finally, follow the podcast on all the socials. We're at WAIR underscore podcast on most things. So come check us out wherever you can for the latest news on upcoming episodes. We have a link tree in our episode show notes where you can come and join our Discord. And remember, adventurers need not apply.